uh, uh, Mr. Joel Salatin. He's a, an inspirational farmer and writer and speaker from Virginia. And I got to hear him speak years ago, and, and he really has inspired me and my farm. I'm Chris from the Paw Paw Festival. And, uh, um, you know, he's going to be talking about local foods to the rescue. And, you know, the Paw Paw, it's a great example of a local food, I think. It, people ask, will the Paw Paw ever be on the grocery store shelf? And I said, I hope not, because it really doesn't need to be there. You know, it can be in your yard. It could be at the farmer's market, and there's a lot of other solutions to uh, the grocery store shelf. So, um, Joel, welcome up. And Joel knows a lot of people from Athens because we have such a great local food community. Uh, it's an honor to introduce Joel Salatin. Thanks, Joel. Thank, you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Well, it's uh, great to be with you here in... Uh, Ohio on the on the uh, beautiful day in September. What a what a perfect day we've got. It couldn't couldn't be better, don't you think? Um, it's really really wonderful. And what a great festival. I I, uh, I didn't know this many people lived in this part of Ohio. There's from Columbus. They <laughs> oh, they all came from Columbus and Cincinnati. Oh, okay, I get it. All right. Um, no, well we. <clears throat> We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit here about uh, a local food system. You know, um, there, there, there's two kind of threads to this. Uh, we you know we've come we've come to a different a, 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 an unusual place in our culture today. I mean, we've moved from the agrarian society to the industrial society, to where um, you know where people used to have their larders and things like that. I mean, you know, if you read. If you read uh, Martha Washington or Dolly Madison's cookbooks that are out now, um, you'll see in there a tremendous amount of foods that we don't, we don't have anymore. Uh, and, and what you realize is that the supposed abundance of the supermarket is actually a reconfiguration of corn and soybeans. That, that's basically what the whole deal is. But in those cookbooks, you see things like currants and plums and choke cherries and... Guess what else? Pawpaws. Pawpaws. That's right. And, and so the average person uh, today in our industrial, centralized, um, segregated, compartmentalized system has not eaten most of the foods that were mainstays of the seasonal, local-centric kind of food system that our forebears grew up on and sustained them uh, through time. I find it fascinating that, that in, our, in our supposed abundance, we have actually denied ourselves the kind of culinary diversity that our ancestors had. We're, we're actually eating far simpler than our ancestors did, which means that our internal community of three trillion beings is being denied a lot of enzymes and combinations that they didn't have before. And so could it be that uh, when they don't get the, the, the complex um, administration of nutrition that they're supposed to get, that we become simpler and even as a culture, simple-minded. So, so um, as we've moved from this agrarian to the industrial system, we've lost a tremendous amount of this, this variety and this heritage-based uh, indigenous type of food. I mean, you know, it, 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 it grew to the point where, you know, we finally had the, um, the revolt of the 1960s that was a revolt against, you know, the 1950s where everything was TV dinners and get out of the kitchen and um, a marginalization of home-centric anything. Our home simply became a, a pit stop uh, between everything that was important in life instead of being the place that was important in life and everything else, an outgrowth of home-centricity. I mean, probably culminated... It probably, you know, epitomized by the notion that uh, during the 1950s and early 60s, um, breastfeeding came out of vogue, you know, and, and, and it was considered barbaric and Neanderthal to breastfeed your babies. And so we raised a, inf a generation of uh, asthmatic sufferers on Infamil and Similac. And I've always thought of, 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 you know, as our culture, talk about one of the, you know, one of the biggest um, 
uh, tragedies of our what wastes of resources is all those that whole generation of breasts that never got used. I mean, <laughs> talk about talk about really uh, really messing up things. And um, so then you know then then it kind of gravitated into the 1970s with the hippie back to the land movement. And uh, who would have thought in the 1950s that by the early 70s we would have La Leche League, we would have Lamaze classes, and we would have, you know, we would have uh, um, um, fathers-to-be who wanted to go in and see it, you know. Uh, that was pretty amazing. That was a major shift. And, of course, this is now uh, uh, moving forward what I call a, local, a local-centric tsunami in our culture that, of course, this festival is... Uh, a part and parcel of that kind of uh, of that kind of awareness, that kind of understanding. Uh, all of us here, I mean, unless there's a Monsanto plant in the crowd or something. Um, but but I'm gonna con- yeah boo. I'm gonna con- I'm gonna assume that the tribe that's assembled here, our tribe, uh, gets the idea that we need to move um, away from the centralized, tyrannous, simplistic ecology destroying nutrition destroying industrial food system and move to one that has integrity and transparency I mean you know we're the first we're the first generation we're the first civilization in which the average person every day routinely eats things that you can't pronounce but you can go down these food carts here, and you can actually pronounce the ingredients. You don't see monosodium glutamate and glycol this and, you know, GMO that. Uh, it's actually, you know, you don't need a, a science laboratory to make it. I mean, if you've got you to have a science lab to make high fructose corn syrup, you might not want to eat it. I'm kind of a believer that if it, if it wasn't available before 1900, you know, I agree with Michael Pollan in Omnivore's Dilemma. You know, you probably, if it wasn't available before 1900, you probably shouldn't eat it. And we can all be very thankful that hot dogs were introduced at the 1890 World's Fair. You know, just slipped right in there under the gun. So, if we're going to move to a local-centric food system, What does it look like and how does it function? One of the problems that this whole local food system has, and it's so so wonderful to be out here. I mean, I do so many talks in the middle of, you know, big cities to foodies and things like that. And, uh, you know, to be out here in a field and, and, um, you know, by a lake in in the heartland and and what really uh, makes the country tick is really a treat. But um, the reality is, that a lot that the local food system has a lot of hurdles uh, against it, and um, one of them is that 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 it's just hard to get to market. It's hard to find markets. It's it's hard to make a system that works. So I'm going to talk about the six components of what I consider to be a really functional, credible local food system, and then hopefully all of you will be able to to take these ideas and then you know ferment them along with your, you know, kombucha and your homebrewed beer, and, and you'll ferment these and, and, and come up with something that's uh, customized for the uh, southern Ohio region. Okay, so, um, so here we go. First of all, you need six things. You need a producer, a processor, an accountant, a marketer, a distributor, and a customer. Six things, all right? Let me do them one more time. A producer, a processor, a marketer, an accountant, a distributor, and a customer. All right? So those are the six things. Let's go through those six very, very quickly. I think I have 40 minutes or something like that. All right. Um, Here we go. The producer. So what kind of a producer is going to be uh, a local-type, local-centric producer? Well, it's going to be a producer that actually does not have no trespassing signs on their farm. You know, if we're going to if we're going to ultimately create a transparent integrity food system, we need the accountability that comes with what Wes Jackson calls eyes to acreage ratios. We need eyes out there seeing. You know, Michael Pollan on Omnivore's Dilemma says that if the if factory farms had glass walls, everybody would be a vegetarian because nobody could abide what they see in those buildings. <clears throat> 
I kind of like the sign that I saw in Australia once I went to visit a farm down there and you drove in. It looked like a no trespassing sign, but actually what it said was, trespassers will be impressed. <laughs> I like that. All right. So, so ultimately, a local food system has to coalesce around farmers who embrace people. Now, in other words, and, and that means our farms need to be, let me just turn this over so it doesn't keep irritating me. Okay, um, that needs to be farms that are people-friendly and neighbor-friendly. You know, if you've got to walk through sheep dip and put on a hazardous material suit to go visit your food, you might not want to go eat that. If you have to walk through a no trespassing sign, get three licenses and check in five booths to go visit your food, that's not a local centric type system. If there's a guard, if there's a guard house and a, and a sign in place and no trespassing signs. So what that means is that our farms need to embrace neighbors, need to embrace people. That means they need to be aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. You know, if a kindergarten class goes and holds their nose all day going, ew, pew, ugly, you know, I don't want to see that, that's not the place you want to be. That's not a local, compatible, neighbor-friendly type of food system. Well, how do you get aesthetically and aromatically, you know, those kinds of farms? Well, you do it with outdoor livestock where we use high-tech electric fencing and portable infrastructure to control shelter and, and get them water, portable, portable water systems, and I, I don't have time today to describe all these things. Just trust me, believe me, that all of these things are possible. They're being done on our farm and many farms like it, where we actually uh, stay awake at night not trying to figure out how to pour concrete or buy fans for a factory confinement uh, concentration camp facility, but how to, um, how to scale up portable tinker toy type uh, 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 shelter mobiles and, and uh, infrastructure. So what we have is a portable farm. That means that it nests into the landscape. Rather than having huge infrastructure that becomes the dominant, the dominant uh, uh, landscape thing, instead when you're driving down the road at 60 miles an hour, all this amazing commercial farming is going on, but it doesn't dominate the landscape. It's embedded in the nest. When we do our, our, our pigs in the forest, you know, our, our acorn pig glens and all that, we've got these, you know, hundreds and, uh, of pigs out in the woods in, in groups. <clears throat> we use just electric fencing and we move them from paddock to paddock every couple of days. And if you were driving by there at 60 miles an hour, you wouldn't even know farming was going on there. That's good farming. It's wildlife friendly. It's neighbor friendly. It's, it's sensually friendly. It's, and it's beautiful. And that's the way these farms should be. What that means is they're farms that enjoy diversity. You know, we've got this idea today that the only way to have a credible farm is to have a single species. You know, a dairy farm, a cherry farm, a, uh, you know, a, a tomato farm. It's all about monospeciation and segregation. But what do we see the template in nature? The template in nature is not about segregation and monospeciation. It's about multispeciation and relational complexity, all right? So these local production farms are going to be farms that have all sorts of varieties of plants and animals, different kinds of plants and animals, living in proximity so that they can actually be synergistic and complementary to each other with symbiotic, symbiotic relationships. So we follow our cows with the egg mobiles. We turn compost with pigs. You know, every pig has a, has a big plow on the end of their face, and uh, they have a sign on their forehead, we'll work for corn. So we, you know, we add corn to the, to the bedding pack and turn the pigs in, and the pigs aerate. We call them pig aerators, you know, like aerobic uh, oxygenation. And, and the pigs do the work. And so rather than being petroleum and infrastructure heavy, it's actually 
uh, it's actually using the animals and plants in their indigenous role to allow them to fully express their self-actualization, what we call the allowing the pigs to express their pigness. In our, in our culture, you know, we don't ask, we don't ask, I mean, have you ever seen a research project at a major land grant university where they said, well, we're going to study, you know, we're going to study pigs, but, um, but the one thing that we can't change in this study is the pigness of the pig. No, we just, you know, as a society, we view pigs as just inanimate piles of protoplasmic structure to be manipulated however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate them. Like, like, like they're machines instead of, instead of life, you know. And this is a mechanical view of life rather than a biological view of life. And the big difference is that machines don't heal, beings can. And we can all be thankful that life can heal. Whether it's forgiving that, that unfortunate statement in a, in a marriage or whether it's a wound on our hand or whether it's a scar on the earth. Biology can heal, and we can be very thankful for that. And so we do dare to ask, how do we create a habitat that allows the pig to fully express its pigness? Because a culture that doesn't ask that question will view with the same kind of manipulative domination standpoint that it does to its pigs and its tomato plants. It will take that same kind of manipulative strategy toward its citizens and toward other cultures. So it's how we respect and honor the pigness of the pig that creates an ethical moral framework on how we respect and honor the Tomness of Tom and the Maryness of Mary. Okay? That's the deal. And so it does matter how we view and, 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 and what kind of a producer we we patronize and I can guarantee you that it's much more enjoyable it's much more local friendly to go to a farm that enjoys the pigness of the pig rather than just a mechanical pig that, that, that the only question is how do we grow it faster fatter bigger cheaper we all know that that's a non-sacred goal I mean the average NFL football player is dead at 57 why because when your neck is bigger than your head you're a freak of nature and nature weeds you out What else about local farms? Well, one thing about local farms, the, the producers, is that they're miniaturized, downsized, restructured. All right? They're not people that are trying to build an empire. There are people embedded in the community. They buy from the community. They patronize the community. They, they, they work with the community. And they market in the community. They're owned by the, they're, they, they know the people in the community. That is a community-centric. They are farms that, um, that, that have a lot of people on them. You know, we've got this idea today that, um, that farms are not people-friendly places. You know, they're dusty, they smell bad. Uh, in fact, many farmers, industrial farmers, don't even want their children to be in farming because it's drudgery and it doesn't pay well and it's, you know, the... the, the it's a social outcast of our culture now. I mean, we, we now have so few farmers, we have twice as many people incarcerated in prisons as we have farming. Um, that, that's, that's the first time that's ever happened in any civilization. Think about it. I mean, J prison inmates now at least have a place on the Census Bureau form. Farmers don't even merit enough people to be on the Census Bureau form. Not that I want to be counted. I just seem to not know where I am. But... But, but, but the point is it gives you pause when you write books like me, like, you know, you can farm, and you realize I'd have twice as many possible readers if I talked about you can be a successful inmate, you know. I mean, so what we want are, are on these local-centric farms, what we want are a lot of young people, youthfulness. The average age of today's farmer is now almost 60 years old. The problem is that when young people can't get into an economic sector, the old people can't get out. And so we've got all these older farmers desperately looking for an exit strategy and young people trying to look in. And so we now have, with portable farms and with, with uh, um, arrangements where we have multi-generational successional uh, uh, arrangements, contracts together, we can have multi-generational farms. 
Well, that's the producer. So the producers are going to be ultimately carbon-centric, local-centric, people-centric, complex-centric. That's the beauty of the English language. You can just tack on suffixes everywhere and make it work. But most people want to have that food processed. Most people don't want five chickens to show up on their front door um, and take them out back and, and, and process them for dinner. They, they, they want an actual, you know, like oven-ready chicken. And so the second part of a local food system that works is we need processing. We need to get this stuff processed. And whether it's a food hub kitchen, uh, a commercial kitchen, uh, an abattoir, to get the animals uh, processed, uh, the, the point is that this, that this raw material needs to be processed. Now, it's important to realize that in the orthodoxy of our day right now, this processing is now one of our biggest hang-up, getting stuff to, to, that, to that processed age, because we've got a food system that is so regulated by what I call the food police that embryonic, innovative products are very difficult to bring to market. If you've tried making cheese lately and selling it to a neighbor, you know, within an hour, five bureaucrats will be knocking on your door giving you a cease and desist order uh, because you don't have a HACCP plan, a, you know, a, a, a commercial kitchen license, you're not zoned for a business, you know, there's any number of, of, uh, of problems. And so, ideally, our, our processing should be done on farms. You know, in our county, it's illegal to have a slaughterhouse on a farm to do your own animals because that's considered manufacturing. And this is an agricultural zone. You know, and we don't want manufacturing in an agricultural zone. I mean, it's illegal for us to take one of our trees mill it on our portable bandsaw mill and make a chair out of it and sell it to a neighbor because making a chair is manufacturing and incompatible with agricultural areas. Well, let me ask you, what better place to butcher the chicken or build the chair than either where the chicken was raised or where the trees grow? Doesn't that make sense? But what we've got now is an incredibly segregated segregated mindset toward the economy you know we put the people over here the manufacturing over here the parks over here and, and we have an, a, an incredibly segregated we don't have you know the cobbler living over his shop and the and the you know the, the hat maker living over his shop we don't have integrated systems and um we, we have segregated systems. In fact, we even zone where, you know, if you can, if you can afford to, to build a 1,200-square-foot house, you can build that over here. But if you can afford to build a 1,500-square-foot house, it has to go over in that subdivision because we certainly wouldn't want the 1,500-square-footers to mingle with the 1,200-square-footers. I mean, that just would never work. And, and we, you know, and we certainly can't have people in a city um, with dogs and cats uh, living in proximity to backyard chickens. I mean, you know, that would just never work. And we could certainly not let somebody butcher a chicken in the city. Oh, my goodness, no. We need pet dogs and boa constrictors and gerbils pooping and peeing and, and, and soiling up everything. But we certainly couldn't have uh, anything like a chicken gut, you know, in a backyard. And so, so what we've done is we've created an incredibly segregated uh, system. So we need processing on the farms. We need, we need integrated systems. We need simple packaging, okay? Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest reasons to can and dehydrate your own food at home is just packaging savings. You use those jars over and over. Um, you know, you, 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 you just, uh, it's not all shrink-wrapped. And this is where I'll give a plug for the, you know, Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund because they are trying to punch through some of these regulatory hurdles so that every American will have the freedom to buy the food of their choice from the source of their choice. So the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund, I mean, we've already used them several times. I mean, the fact that you can, that you, can uh, um, you know, feed your kids Mountain Dew, Twinkies, and Cocoa Puffs but raw milk is illegal, 
it, it is an absolute uh, a travesty of our day. And so uh, ultimately we need to be able to own our own bodies, own our own freedoms, and among consenting adults be able to engage in commerce to buy and trade as voluntary uh, uh, contractual people in a local economy without ten federal bureaucrats being in between the transaction. Number three, so we got production, we got processing. Number three is marketing. Somebody's got to market this stuff. Now, I don't know whether you realize it or not, but typically farmers are some of the worst marketers in the world because most of us who are farmers really don't like people. That's why we're farmers, you know. <laughs> Bunch of old hermit curmudgeons, right? And so when I say marketing, I don't necessarily mean the farmer has to market, but somebody has to market. Somebody who's a gregarious storyteller schmoozer. Okay? I'll give you one guess as to who that is in my family. All right? So we need, we need marketers. We need people to come alongside the local food system and market to be able to tell the story, to be able to... Uh, to explain what this local is, to give the nutritional data, to give how it's raised, to, you know, photographers, part of marketing, you know, pretty pictures to, to illustrate, you know, here are the animals out in the pasture, here's the compost pile, you know, here's the, uh, you know, the, the, the crowd work at the CSA farm uh, putting in the asparagus beds, you know, to be able to tell that story. Now, uh, I'm a big believer in word of mouth marketing. Yeah, you can buy advertising and things like that, but really, if you have epiphanal stuff, whether it's crafts, food, or shelter, or energy solutions, if you have epiphanal stuff, people will come and patronize it. So we've always used the, um, you know, the 80-20 principle, word of mouth. I find it fascinating that even the companies that pay $2 million dollars for a 30-second Super Bowl ad, still get 80% of their business from word-of-mouth advertising from satisfied customers. You know, wouldn't you think that if that's a well-known business axiom, wouldn't you think that big businesses would spend more time in customer service and actually answering the phone with a person? That's one of our uh, one of our value statements on our farm. You know, we'll never use a robotic, you know, press one, press two, press three uh, phone answering device. Uh, we're going we're gonna to answer the phone, okay, and we're going to have a person there that, uh, that goes. You know, a lot of people can't imagine um, enough market for a local food system, but I want you just to imagine the local, wherever, you know, the people that aren't here. I know you all here, you get it. You're in the tribe. I, I got it, all right? But all the people that aren't here, you know, the ones that are still down at, you know, Dairy Queen and Arby's and whatever, you know, um, all of those folks, think about what could be grown and what's available within 100 miles of the supermarket. There's a lot of stuff. Now, you're not going to grow bananas here. You're going to grow something better, you know, pawpaws. Pawpaws are the ultimate banana, right? So, so, so uh, you don't need bananas. You can have pawpaws, all right? And, uh, and, and there's a lot of stuff that can be grown within 100 miles of a supermarket. So the markets, the markets are absolutely huge. One of, the, um, one of the beauties of a local food system is that if every area that could grow all the stuff within 100 miles of its supermarkets and things, if it would, it would it would fundamentally change the food system. I know, you know, if you live 100 miles from a Coke machine, marketing might be a little bit difficult. But if everyone who could direct market, local market, collaboratively market, local-centrically market, would, it would so change the food system, we can't even imagine what would poke out the other end. That's what's cool. Number four, accounting. Oh, my. You know what? Somebody's got to watch the money, all right? I mean, these local-centric, local food si businesses and systems need somebody to watch the money. Fortunately, you know, I'm married up. 
and, uh, and, and have a wife that's more frugal than I and will spend eight hours looking for a penny. That's what you want for an accountant, see. You want somebody that will chase down the money and keep you on. No, you can't spend it. We don't have the money. Or, yeah, now, okay, you know, and releases uh, $5, let you go get something. Um, but, you know, if, you're, if your accounting system is throwing all the invoices in a box and at the end of the year carrying the box down to a tax planner, uh, that's not the way to run a business, okay? We need P&L statements. We need monthly statements. We need, we need to track information where we are. Somebody has to watch the money, fill out the employees, pay the bills, and fill out the paperwork. That doesn't mean the same person has to do all this stuff. It can be a group of people. In fact, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest holdbacks of successful farmers is that they don't early on team up with people that have gifts where they're weak. And, and, and farmer, you know, we're such an independent lot. I'm going to do it all, you know. Me and Matilda, we don't want anybody else on this place because, you know, we did this ourselves and we're going to, you know, we're going to go bankrupt ourselves too. Uh, but farmers are an incredibly independent lot. And when we, but, but when we realize early on, you know, I'm really good at this, this, and this, but I'm not good at this, this, and this, and we, and, and we get somebody to do that, the whole thing, the, the whole boat floats higher. It, it, it's, it's a whole lot easier. Our son Daniel has a great way of saying this. He says, you know, the thing, there, there are things that when you get up in the morning, you can't wait to go do some things, all right? I mean, there are things that we really like. You know, this, is, this is my joelness, right? You know, I'm going to really want to do this. And there are other things that we wake in the mo up in the morning and say, oh, you know, I want to just go back to bed because I know I have to do this and I hate doing that and I can't stand doing that. Did you know that there are actually people in the world who that thing that you can't stand to get up for, they can't wait to get out of bed to do. So we need to find them quickly. And that's what these kind of festivals are for, is for networking and, and building a, a network, a, a collaborative tribe in which the, the accountants in the group and the guys that love to balance checkbooks and pay bills and do paperwork, I mean, Man, you know, blessings on you. You need to come alongside these poor, struggling farmers that can't balance a checkbook and don't ever want to keep any records. That's, you know, that, that's what we need. All right. Number five. Number five, distribution. Okay. Somebody's got to get it to market. Somebody's got to get it to Columbus, Zanesville, Wheeling, whatever, okay? Somebody's got to get it out to these markets. Well, how are we going to get it out there? And this is, again, one of the big shortfalls in the local food system. Uh, there's actually been some amazing uh, carbon footprint studies done of farmers' markets. And what they're finding is that the carbon footprint of farmers' markets is actually larger than supermarkets because even though they're only going on an average of 40 miles, they're only carrying, uh, uh, you know, 100 pounds of stuff. Whereas Jolly Green Giant, even though they're going 1,500 miles, they're actually, you know, they're, they're, they're taking 48,000 pounds of stuff in the back of a tractor trailer. So this is a real problem. So we need, to, we need to start thinking about distribution and how do we create a local system that actually competes with the supposed efficiencies of the, of the uh, supermarket. How do, we, how do we glum together enough stuff? And so I'm a big believer in, uh, in creating a distribution system that is highly collaborative where we can work with other people um, where we can use the internet for electronic aggregation now don't let me lose you here but I'm gonna get just a little bit I'm gonna go over my own skis for a minute because I don't even I can barely do email okay I'm just not of that generation uh, but but I can tell you that that our farm now sells you know half of its stuff almost in internet uh, shopping carts to the metropolitan sector so that we can distribute with what we call metropolitan buying clubs and they are they are set people I mean it's the coolest thing it's, it's almost like a drug drop these, these people order stuff on the internet we go into the city with our contraband at, 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 a, at a stop spot at somebody's house everybody our, our tribe you know our tribe meets us there at the appointed time 
takes the stuff out of their coolers, gives us uh, cash or checks, and we throw that in the and we throw the empty coolers in the truck. And in 30 minutes, we're heading out of Dodge. You know, the business license people didn't know we were there. The food people didn't know we were there. Nobody knew we were there. I mean, it's totally guerrilla marketing. You know, under the system. But it uses it uses the democrat the democratization of the internet, and and I think that that it, if if you agree with me that the local food system is now on the cutting edge of of our of integ of the integrity food tsunami, we need to appreciate that we're going to stay on that cutting edge by embracing some of the best electronic technology that's out there in order to leverage in order to electronically aggregate. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that bricks and mortar interfaces are very, very expensive. High overheads, high people requirements, high licensure requirements, high government regulatory requirements. But when we aggregate electronically, so we have an electronic shopping cart, now suddenly people can shop in the convenience of their own home. We can work with 30, 40 other farmers if we want to, and we can aggregate this stuff on farms, put them in a, in a truck, and deliver them right into the city. MIT has just done a study on one of these. It's called Relay Foods. It's in the eastern part of the country. We collaborate with them, and they found that their carbon footprint was far less even than a supermarket because Everybody's get because the, 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 the distribution of a dedicated vehicle going house to house making drops like a FedEx truck is actually cheaper than trying to put all that in people friendly fluorescent lighted bathroom handicapped parking bricks and mortar interfaces with cash registers. And so, so this whole distribution angle has to become far more collaborative and using. Um, infrastructure and finally number six the sixth part of a local food system that works is you, you can have all the stuff I mentioned you can have the production you can have the processing you can have the marketing the accounting and you can even have the distribution but it doesn't work until you have somebody to buy it a customer that's right so what kind of a customer I mean, I do a lot of urban foodie type things, you know, and the first thing people ask me is, okay, you know, I live in a condominium in the middle of a high rise in the city, you know, what can I do? And I love to describe to them, okay, here's the kind of customer we're looking for. You know, if we could, if we could like make a, a job description for, a, for an integrity food customer, okay? Here's what it would be, all right? You ready? All right, we're looking for a customer who loves seasonality, who doesn't demand fresh tomatoes from Peru in Athens in January, okay? I was doing a radio program up in Maine in January uh, one, one year, and the radio host was giving me a hard time about the high price of organic food. You know, he said, I went down to Whole Foods or whatever, or, you know, the supermarket, and organic uh, sweet corn, I was going to do this party last week, and uh, or, I wanted to serve uh, sweet corn. D did you catch when this was? This was Maine in when? January. All right. Good. Oh, you're, you're staying. It's good. It's a very tuned in. Uh, are Pawpaw's brain food, too? They must be. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they look a little bit like a brain, you know, brain or a kidney, one, but anyway, both of them are good. All right, so um, one's how you take it in, one's how you get rid of it, right? So, okay. Um, so anyway, th this guy's asked me about this, you know, I just, I just boy, you know, the organic uh, sweet corn was like, you know, two forty nine dollars a dozen and the regular was one forty nine. How can you justify that price difference? Wrong question. Wrong question is, why do you need fresh sweet corn shipped in from Peru in a, in a party in Maine in January? That's the question. You know, why, why can't we celebrate the seasonality of things? I mean, the, the, uh, the emotional and, and whatever, uh, spiritual joy of that first 
strawberry in the spring, right? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's just, why deny your spirit the joy of that first strawberry? It's, it's something to look forward to the whole year, you know, after eating the last one. Uh, it's something to look forward to. And, and, and you, you can dehydrate them, you can make them into jam, you can freeze them, you can do all sorts of cool stuff to have them, you know, throughout the season, to, to spread uh, these kind of things throughout the season. But the point is, we want people who celebrate seasonality uh, and just, just literally embrace it and celebrate it and, uh, and, and buy in volume when it's really available and, uh, you know, Eat it either preserved or not eaten at all, you know, during the, during the wintertime. Which brings me to the second thing that we're looking for. We're looking for a customer who is jazzed up about becoming more skillful at domestic culinary arts. I mean, we have spent a couple of generations marginalizing homemakers, and that's not a sexual connotation you know you, you, you know the root of husband you know you know the root of husband is housebound housebound so when a husband takes a wife the this this wild man becomes housebound that's husband okay all right so domestic culinary skills you know we've spent a couple generation right telling Americans telling people that domestic culinary arts are passe. You know, we don't teach home ec in the schools anymore. Um, you know, subcontract that out to uh, Dean Foods and uh, Procter and & Gamble and, and whatever, right? Um, as, if, as if getting in your kitchen is, is, what, is what non-intelligent people do, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the social outcast, you know, they're the ones that get in their kitchen. Get in your kitchen, what do you want to do? Go back to hoop skirts, hearth cooking, and, and uh, washboards, you know, as if that's romantic to somebody that's never done it before. Um, but when I say cultivate domestic culinary arts, I'm not talking about hoop skirts and washboards and, and, and hearth cooking. I'm talking about the most techno glitzy gadgetized culinary experiences you can imagine our kitchens today aren't grandma's kitchen we got we don't have to get up at four o'clock split kindling and start a fire i mean we just go down there turn on the gas or the electric and we got boom we got stove you know we got we don't have to go to the spring and carry water in a bucket i mean we got we got two faucets one's even hot and one's even cold i mean it's amazing we got stainless steel we got we got uh, a refrigerator, you know, uh, you don't have to go down to the spring house and get the sour buttermilk. I mean, you, you got it right there in the, in the refrigerator. Um, we've got time-baked slow cookers. I mean, the ultimate way to, to have a, a convenience dinner is just throw everything in a crock pot, walk out for the day, come back 40 watts all day, just sitting there, just kind of, blah, 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 you know, percolate. And you, you can eat at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. I mean, it never dries out. It just stays, blah, 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 you know. I mean, it's the, it's the ultimate uh, no-work dinner, right? Um, and, and we've got all these cool, we've got Cuisinarts and, and uh, woks and s cool uh, stainless steel spatulas and all sorts of electric skillets and, and, and bread makers. This isn't Grandma's Kitchen. It's the coolest place in the world. Ultimately, you cannot have a food system of integrity and accountability unless it is fundamentally home-centric. What we're, what we're celebrating at this festival is, yes, here we are, you know, the front row is all full of people with, you know, iPhones and, and whatever, you know, re recording this, and maybe there are people tweeting and whatever else. But what we're actually celebrating here is, yes, a hand on technology. We've got it. But we also understand that we have a foot firmly planted and a hand firmly grasping the fact that our three trillion member internal community did not grow up on monosodium glutamate and high fructose corn syrup. And so we fully embrace 
the traditions, the indigenous wisdom. We respect and honor the sacredness of place and time and, and anchorage and heritage. While we use technology to better massage and caress this great earth womb lover that we all embrace. So what we want, we want customers who are as excited about getting in the kitchen as they are reading People magazine and learning about the latest belly button piercing in Hollywood celebrity culture. Who are as jazzed up about sharing a pawpaw recipe as they are the latest dysfunction in the Kardashian household. Okay, so culinary skills. The next thing is, what kind of a customer do we want? We want a customer who appreciates that you get what you pay for. We, uh, we, have, we have a cheap food policy in this country. I'm sure you're very aware of it. In fact, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the movie Food, Inc. Many of you? Food, Inc. All right. Powerful movie. All right. Well, there's one, there's one kind of, uh, you know, victimhood uh, poor spot, in, in my opinion, and that's where that family says they can't afford good food while they're munching on a great big uh, Burger King uh, uh, biggie meal in the back seat, you know. The guy's got like a 154-ounce uh, soft drink and a, and a great big fries and a, all this. I know what those things cost. I don't buy them, but I know what they cost, you know, about 10 bucks. And you know what? You could get two whole pounds of grass-finished, ground beef, world class from our farm or from any number of other farms for less than that great big Burger King unpronounceable junk meal. The fact is that there's money in the system. When somebody says, oh, I can't afford, you know, I can't afford to eat well, I can't afford good food, I grab them quickly and I say, okay, 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 quick, quick, uh, take me to your house. We're going to go to your house right now, uh, and I'm sure we're going to drive in a jalopy, uh, and we're going to go to your house, and here's what we're not going to see. We're not going to see soft drinks, tobacco, coffee, alcohol, lottery tickets, golf clubs, Netflix, widescreen flat, flat, what is it, widescreen TV, um, iPods, iPhones. We're not going to see, did I say tobacco? We're not going to see um, uh, People magazine. We're not going to see $100 designer jeans with holes already in the knees. The fact is that a lot of money is spent on things that we don't need. That's the truth. So, you know, in, in, in more intimate settings than this, if I'm in a, in a crowded room, you know, I'll say, y'all just tell me, what do people spend money on that is un unnecessary? None of us, none of us, not talking about us, I'm talking about them, those people out there that aren't here, see. And what you come up with is, you know, if, if we only spent money on what was important, I mean, there wouldn't even be a Hollywood, there wouldn't be Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried, there wouldn't be McDonald's, there wouldn't be, you know, none of this stuff. There's plenty of money. I mean, take all the money that Coca-Cola takes in. You know, we don't even need, who needs Coca-Cola, okay? So, you know, we can make Paw Paw wine. Um, just, just, the fact is, there is, there is money in the system, and if you buy Whole Foods and prepare, process, preserve, and package them in your own home kitchen, you cut your price way, way down. I was in uh, New York City at, at, um, at the Green Market in Union Square, the most expensive farmer's market in the world, arguably. All right, I had my hostess, I said, I want you to take me to the most expensive potato in the most expensive farmer's market in the most expensive city of the world. Okay, so she took me down to this vendor, and he had this beautiful stand with these, all these little cubby holes. Of, he must have had, you know, 30 varieties of potatoes. It was like a work of art. There were blue ones, yellow ones, red ones, purple ones, beautiful little, you know. And um, so I looked through, looked through, looked through, and found the most expensive one. It was a Peruvian uh, blue fingerling potato. $2 a pound. The market is surrounded by food marks with aisles, literally aisles full of potato chips for $4.99 a pound. So the most expensive, 
heritage, blah, 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 potato in the world on the most expensive market in the world is less than half the price of a regular GMO potato chip at the supermarket. There's enough money in the system, folks. There's enough money in the system. In fact, if we took all the money that was spent making sure we had cheap oil in the Iraq war and took the money that was spent in that conflagration for just one day, it would, buy, it would double the per plate rate of every single plate of food in every single school in America for an entire year. We have the money, okay? We have the money. Besides that, you wouldn't have to take so many pills and the pharmaceuticals could go bankrupt. So this is the kind of customer we're looking for. Somebody that loves their kitchen, loves seasonality, doesn't beat us up on price all the time, and wants to come on as a, as a fellow team member. So there you have it. The local food system that answers the paranoia. We have, we have a paranoid food culture right now. We, people are so ignorant and disconnected about food. I mean, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll say something real sexist. You know, all of our customers are women. You know, all men do is, you know, look in the refrigerator, open the door, grunt, say, honey, I can't find it, and close it. That's all men do. Forty years ago, you couldn't get a skinless, boneless breast. You couldn't get it. Yeah, if you wanted a boneless, skinless breast for your recipe, you had to go get a chicken, take a knife and a cutting board, and, you know, whack it out. Today, 90% of our customers don't even know that a chicken has bones. I mean, they think we go out and, you know, pick up, like, boneless, skinless breasts off the boneless, skinless breast tree or something, you know. And, and so, um, so if, we're going to, if we're going to reconnect here, What's happened is that as we've created this culinary ignorance, we've created a fear because people fear what they don't know. I mean, customers call us, uh, if I thaw this chicken in the sink, will it get salmonella? You know, people don't know food. And so if we're going to have a system that runs on faith in food instead of fear of food, we're all going to have to embrace not an abdication of visceral participation, but an all-encompassing embrace of participation. It's going to be up to all of us, with our friends, our neighbors, to increase this tribe and bring others into this fold to appreciate that ultimately you can't undo the fear of scarcity and the fear of pathogenicity and the fear of nutrient deficiency and the fear of ecological devastation and the fear of animal abuse and the fear of toxicity. You can't undo that without actually jumping in off the sidelines into the nature's game, into this womb and embracing a participatory healing remediation. I hope we're up to that task, and I can't wait to see what the next years of unleashing this tribe in this part of the world will do to this area, because I think you guys get it, I think you embrace it, and I think you're ready to take this on to the next level in this region, leveraging the producer, the processor, the distributor, the accountant, the marketer, and the customer with a local food system that solves the paranoia, the concerns, and the fears of our current industrial food system malaise. Thanks for letting me visit with you now. May all of your carrots, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large and not pithy. May uh, a tomato blossom end rot affect the Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. May the, may the uh, coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary uh, experiments be delectably palatable. May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise and call you blessed. And may we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. Thank you so much for letting me visit with you. Thank you.